What I'm so excited about today is not only who's in the room and who's a part of this, but also who will be in the room and who will be a part of this. The filmmakers have taken charge of their own destiny and created this statement. First, I just want to kiss this document. <laughs> I think I must have died and gone to independent filmmaker is heaven. For the first time, I'll be able to say there is something that you can read. We can actually um, really take a stronger stand and defend our rights as filmmakers. Who owns our history? This is fair use. Copyright is not an absolute right, but a conditional one. In our country, under our laws and our Constitution, copyright exists for one purpose and one purpose only, to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Art doesn't come from nowhere. Cultural progress depends on the ability of artists to make reasonable use of pre-existing material, and that includes copyrighted material. This is especially true today for filmmakers who operate in a media-saturated environment. In order to be able to comment on that environment, in order to be able even to depict that environment, they need reasonable access to other people's copyrighted material. Fair use in copyright law exists to assure that that access continues to be available. And it exists for another reason as well. Out of hand, copyright can become an instrument of censorship, not official censorship, but private censorship. And fair use is a safeguard against such misuse of copyright. People are just scared to use fair use. I know that I was scared away from using it. You know, with my first film, I Am a Man, which also uses a lot of images from popular culture, taking a look at, you know, black masculinity. You know, lawyers, you know, would scare me and say, you know, you can't use, you know, fair, you know this, this does qualify for fair use, but I wouldn't use it if I were you. And that's really when I have started to act as though fair use does not exist. Because every time I've tried to think it did, I would be, you know, surprised by some, you know, incidental piece of music in a scene that the lawyers got worried about um, errors and emissions insurance people got concerned about or a client got concerned about. Intimidation in the, in the clearance culture doesn't come in the form of a jackbooted thug knocking on your door. It comes in, it's, it's a way of looking at the material. It it's, becomes a lens through which you, you look at the, all of the elements of your story. Uh, everything becomes about can I clear the rights for this particular image before even deciding whether it's worth using in the story. When documentary filmmakers just had to guess about what was appropriate application of fair use, they were putting themselves at risk. What if they guessed wrong? What they really needed to know was what their community felt, and particularly the professional, the veterans, the people who have some experience. And what we found when we talked to members of five different filmmaker organizations across the country was that there was remarkable consensus among professional filmmakers who had two films nationally distributed about what was appropriate and reasonable application of this statute. And the result is the documentary filmmaker's statement of best practices and fair use. Susan, it's probably the most frivolous issue of all, but how many women, or is there any way of knowing how many women, vote for a male candidate because they find him attractive? I think what you can't do is play down to teenagers, play down to the young people. No teenager is going to be satisfied with a PG-13 rated horror film. But it was Rove the Tactician who caught the eye of the CBS News White House correspondent, Dan Rather. Down in the basement of party headquarters is the operation aimed... The statement of best practices is going to be useful as guidance for filmmakers and for gatekeepers broadcasters, distributors, and others. And if one of these controversies should ever find its way to court, it'll be useful there as well. When courts decide fair use issues, they reach out for information about what's considered to be reasonable practice in the field. 
and the filmmaker statement of best practices is going to be excellent evidence of that consensus in the field of documentary filmmaking. ITVS is not PBS, but we, you know, we have a business relationship with them insofar as we have to make sure that the films that we bring them can be aired by them. And so we need to be in agreement so that you know, we're not throwing each other curveballs and, and us saying, this one's fine, and them saying, no, you know, we need to be on the same page. And hopefully that same page will be this, this best practices statement. I, I, we at POV really view this as the beginning of a process. This, this is a process now of, of education of educating the insurance industries, the gatekeepers, the broadcasters, and producers. And we think that this document, uh, with that education, will become the gold standard for that perennial question which we get from filmmakers, is this fair use or do I have to license it? The great thing about having this statement is that we'll be able to distribute it online and obviously tell them to go to the Center for Social Media website so that filmmakers can educate themselves um, and therefore start making their work accordingly. I mean, for me, uh, the statement of best practice is something that is reasserting our democratic values and is a way for us to preserve and, you know, continue to use our own cultural history.